Hello, everyone. I'm here to do a very special interview with Patty McLaughlin. Patty has been writing children's books for almost 50 years, and she's created an incredible and beautiful and celebrated body of work. Whether she's writing lyrical picture books, like The Poet's Dog, or Prairie Days, or historical novels, like the classic Sarah Plain and Tall, which was awarded the Newbery Medal, or Skylark, or emotional family stories like Journey or Baby. Her work is singularly exquisite. Her beautiful language and deeply felt characters make us love her book so much that the experience we have when they're over is one of sorrow. We want them to last forever. I have a feeling that this interview, we're gonna feel the same way about that we'll want it to last forever. So I think given that, I'm going to uh, end my remarks and introduce you to the amazing, to the wonderful Patricia McLaughlin. Patty, are you there? I am here, thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna wait to see your wonderful face. There you are, so nice <laughs> to see you. Thank you. Where are you coming from? Where are we Where are we contacting you? I am in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. In in the beautiful mountains of the of the Berkshire. That's true. I live on a mountain. Yes, I do. Like a like a hermit. Yes, I do. Very <laughs> much. All I see are birds and coyotes and bears. Oh my goodness! Yeah. What an exciting life you have. It well, is <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Stay safe. Uh, so I'm going to get right to right to some of the questions that we have talked about because everyone's going to want to hear from you and they certainly don't want to hear from me. So let's start let's start with your body of work. So in describing your body of work and the language that you use, there's certain words that always come to to bear. People say that your language is poetic or spare or taught or restrained. I know you as a person and none of those words actually apply to you. <laughs> <laughs> restrained be the last word I would use for you, but these are all qualities in your writing that other writers aspire to. So let's start with, if you can define for us, what's the key to that and how do you achieve that beautiful poetic spare quality? Well, you know, that happened, I happen to know, uh, when I was five or six years old and I used to sit behind a big chair in my parents' room and a big bookcase behind it and I read all the books and I found a couple of books I thought had too many words and I put parentheses around some of the words. <laughs> and my mother was horrified. She may, had to go through and have me erase it. I said, but these words were too many words. They got in the way of the story. So oh, oh, anyway, my father was a professor. He was a German um, professor and he had many students who would come and they would always say, where's the little reader? And that'd be me behind the chair. Oh, and um, my parents, gave me notebooks to write in and I wrote titles. I invented them. I liked the titles of books and I don't know why I did that. I was four or five years old and I wrote down the titles. And then I also corrected other people's books. But um, she one day said to me, I showed her something I'd written and it was this, my cats have names and seem happy. Often they play the end. And she said, oh my God, you've written a poem. I wish your father could do the same kind of thing and not have such dense stuff. She had to reread all his stuff. And so I kept kind of kept that in me and right then. And then from then on, I wrote in spare ways. It was just part of who I was. And so it's a conscious decision as well, not to have too many words. I think so. I think I like books that allow me to enter them. And if there are too many words, I don't know where I'm going. Isn't that an interesting thing? I remember when I was in college reading uh, Moby Dick, and I pretty quickly figured out that the 30 pages that was describing whaling and harpooning, I didn't have to read. <laughs> you did not have to, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, also, so I got into my parents' books, and I asked my parents one day, what does passion mean? And they clearly were upset that I'd gotten into the adult section. And my father said, well, you can be passionate about tennis or golf. And my mother burst out laughing. So when we get to the very end, I'll tell you how this comes into a book I'm working on today. Okay, well, I can hardly yeah. wait to see that. 
Well, so the other thing that your that your books are are known for is their sort of emotional honesty, their emotional truth, and yet you do that with very few words. So what I want to know is, is it hard getting to the heart of the emotion? You do really deep stuff. You're it's it's not just like a, a you know a passing feeling. You deal with love and loss and the the big part of the life cycle. How do you do that? And how do you do that with, with such spare language? I think that's the only way I can get into it is the spare language because I have to be there somewhere. And I think I want to invite the reader in. And so mm -hmm. the reader can come too. Does that sound pretentious? Uh, uh, not to me, no. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we're both pretentious. <laughs> right. Great. It seems that that's the only way I go through I'm writing a novel now and I go through it every day and delete words and the words that I don't delete my daughter Emily reads and she'll say why do you need this you had this once before and so my children seem to understand my work too. You know it's very interesting because one of the things that new writers do is they fall in love with their own words and they exactly yes. so you so you are merciless with yourself. Yeah, I'm not in love with my own words unless I write something, I reread something I wrote a long time and I think, oh gosh, that's good. I really like the beginning of Sarah Plain and Tall because yeah. it's very cinematic. And having written films, I know what that is, cinematic. Well, yeah, every, everybody is in love with Sarah Plain and Tall. And speaking of which, so let's talk about writing a classic, which I think you certainly, you've done many times, but certainly Sarah Plain and Tall is going to be on this earth for a very long time. And mm. once um, I read something that you wrote where you said about writing a classic, you said, it's the quiet, soft moments of honesty that transcend the years. So I think we should talk about honesty and how you get to it, how you remember it or imagine it and what you have to strip away to get to the to the heart of the matter? I do a lot of stripping away. I like stripping. Excuse me, that's a bad <laughs> sentence. <laughs> now out all over Twitter. <laughs> but I like uh, the pee, I like peeling away. And I look, I like becoming part of the landscape. And I was very much a part of the landscape when I started that book. I knew where it was because I was born in Wyoming and it was out there. And so I think landscape is a really important word. I think too many writers don't get in their landscape, both their words and where they're writing about. I don't think that's a very good sentence, but you get it. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the landscape, are you talking about the physical landscape as well as the emotional landscape? Yes, as well, yes. I think it, it matters where a book takes place and what's going on and where it is. And kids know that. You think? I think kids are smarter than most of us. Yeah. So when you're writing, do you envision a reader when you write? Do you see a child or, or a child with an adult or just an adult? I see all of those people. I see a book as if maybe being read to a child by an adult, uh, like a mother or father, like singing a song to a child. And I think it should speak to both of them in some ways. That's what I try really hard to do, to have something for the adult to hold and something for the child to grab onto. And what do you, what do you hope they feel after reading one of your books? I hope they feel that, that's an interesting question. I, I, I hope they feel what I feel. But um, it's really interesting, not long ago, a child came to my front door with her teacher and she had a big painting of one of my books and she gave it to me and she said, you make me feel better. And then she went home and I have this great framed pic painting that she did. And maybe that's what I want. Maybe I want to, I think maybe communicating makes them feel better if they know what I'm saying. I don't wanna preach which which you don't do and yet you go right to the heart of the matter you, you, you don't shy away from difficult emotions no it's kind of called an arrow isn't it uh tell me more about that i don't know about that i just made it up i mean it's just what i care about so much that it goes right there yeah the, and you, um, you aim the the aim the arrow yeah and, and when you when you start a book is that in your mind do you know what your what the 
emotional truth that you're setting out to write about is? Um, no, it comes as I write and I go back and forth and I delete. I love deleting. I love my delete button. It's so good. And yeah. I wish I could get it to do whole paragraphs instead of just one word at a time. But I keep going back and I have started a novel now that started out one way and I've gotten to um, chapter 13 and I have to go back because I realize I'm writing about something else at the same time. Are you, what, when you undertake a novel, are you, do you know how it's gonna end? Do you have it? Uh, uh, no. In oh. fact, that's part of my problem. I'm glad we're having this talk today because I'm supposed to be writing the end. Uh, and you don't know where you're going? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, but it will come to me and I think it will be simple and it will grow out of the last couple chapters. I have to reread them because then I will know. Wow. It does, that doesn't scare you. Have you ever written a book and written yourself right into a corner that you couldn't get out of? Of course. And then what? I fixed it. <laughs> I went back and rewrote and redid. I did write a whole novel about a woman becoming president in the United States and they declined it. It was when, it was a few years ago when Hillary Clinton was running. Uh -huh. I just thought it was an interesting thing for a child to have a mother become president. It was a very annoying thing. <laughs> and the child became very um, connected to the secret service man. Oh, and it's um, a service. It became a surrogate parent. I might get that out again. Well, I was going to say, it sounds like maybe the time has come. That would. That I would think be. I'm going to tell him you said so. Are, <laughs> are you are you a reader, and what kind of books uh, move you? No, I'm not a reader anymore because of my eyes, and I can't read books. I can't even read my own books in print. So that when I have um, a Zoom chat with a group of students, one of my children will usually come here and just read the whole book quickly to me and then I get it. Isn't, and I said to my eye doctor once, am I going nuts? He said, there's nothing nuts about you. It's that you can't write things down so you don't remember them. Oh. So um, I forget, see what your question was. Well, so I know if you don't mind talking about this, I, I oh. know personal, but I know that you're struggling with vision loss. Oh, yeah. And so and you know, I get very annoyed when I go on Audible and somebody's reading a book and I don't like the way they're reading it. I know. I know. Isn't that awful? I mean, I have a friend, Tracy Kidder, who writes wonderful books and I've heard him read. I don't want to hear somebody else read him book books. So um, I don't know what I'm going to do. But the books, of course, I remember are the books that that were clear and 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 terse and like Natalie Babbitt, who else would write, you know, about the devils coming out from the hell to see what the world was about and Tuck Everlasting. And so let's talk a little bit about your your life decisions. Um, you've you've written exclusively for children. I don't believe you've written for adults, have you? No, yeah. I haven't. I'm like children. You know what I think this is. I think they know everything. And especially in this day and age, this is a frightening time for them. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my grandchildren are having oh, really a lot of sadness and stress because they all have their devices. They're all, they know everything, mm -hmm. but they're also very direct. And they call me up. My, my grandson, Harry, who's in third grade, wrote me a note and said, Ama, that's what he calls me. Um, I've written two or three stories. Could you please send them to your editor so I can be published? And I said, sure, if I can find somebody who wants it. <laughs> and his younger sister, who's in first grade, you may have to edit this, wrote an essay called Making Love. Ooh. And she dedicated it to her male um, teacher, who she liked very much. And of course, the making love was acts of kindness. But right. there are things like this that make me think the children they believe everything and they want to know everything and they're still eager, but they're kind of alone now, which is fearful for them. Yeah, very, very much alone. And so yeah. it makes the work that we do as authors even more important. Because I think so. You know, when you put a book in their hands and suddenly, particularly if kids aren't necessarily seeing friends. So the they aren't seeing friends. No. Right. So the characters in the book become even more real. And I think that's absolutely right. And that I talk to a lot of kids about that. 
they'll say, is this real? And I said, well, it's very real to me. Right. And there, of course, is that wonderful note that I got from a kid after um, Sarah Plain and Tall. He wrote, Dear Mrs. McLaughlin, uh, Sarah Plain and Tall is the second to the greatest book I've ever read, Love Donald. Uh -huh. I kept that for years on my fridge uh -huh. because I just thought that was so wonderful. What was the first? I mean, not that I cared, but I just love the honesty of children. And so is that that is that what when you first decided to write for children, you were a young mother, right? You you were Yeah, I was. You were yeah. writing for your own children. That's right. And also you write so much about your family and your fam your family history. Sarah Plain and Tall, I guess, is based was, on Yeah, that was some of my family history, yes. You I there was a male order bride in your in your family history? Yes, there was a mail order bride. It didn't end as happily as that one. Uh -huh. That story did. That's why I like my truth better than the other truth. That truth. <laughs> Do you think that's part of your writing that you you're rewriting? Uh, the I think story? I'm trying to make some things better or maybe more accessible, especially for children, particularly in this time. So you you write so much about uh, uh, or your own family history and your landscape where you grew up is so much. A part I do. Of your work. So do you believe that everyone we now have, don't be nervous, but we now have 5,000 people listening to this conversation. Do you think that most oh. of them, most of us have a story inside of them? I looked at that question for a long time. And then I thought, yes, I think they probably have a story in them if they only recognize their landscape maybe where they came from, where they want to go, where they've been, what is their sadness, what is their great joy. And so I think they don't think of themselves as important enough to write a book, which is really silly because all you have to do is a, let, walk into it. I feel like I, I write spare books so that I can walk into it. Mm -hmm. So the words are cluttering and you have a pathway. The words are big and I can go in and be there. You know, I, I just, it, through my work in the SCBWI, I see a lot of manuscripts and I see people who have clearly mastered a, a great deal of craft. They write good dialogue. They have a, you know, a compelling opening, but what's sometimes missing is exactly what you're talking about is understanding what's important about your personal experience and, or your personal observations. I think they haven't figured it out. They haven't. Of course, I was married to a shrink many years ago. He's gone now, but um, he was a great father and a great husband. And I learned a lot about knowing yourself. Not that he did it to me, but being around him. Mm -hmm. And all our kids are that way. They're very self-knowing. Mm -hmm. In fact, Emily told me a great story this morning. She has a 16-year-old. And the 16-year-old was really stressed and she said, and she said to my daughter, Emily, you're the dumbest person in this house, which I thought was the funniest thing I'd ever heard because she has a father and a brother and why did she pick Emily? And then she apologized. But I think it's these things that happen in life that are so interesting that people don't pay attention to. Yeah. I find the right about that sometimes. Do you, do you keep notebooks or journals? Um, yeah, but I can't see them anymore. So I... I, I kept a lot of stuff I wanted to say to you right behind you on my computer. And of course I can't see it um, only on my computer, but yes, I, I, I don't write every day, but mostly I'm writing fiction every day. I do it there, you know, instead. But, but would your ability to take your own life and see the drama in it? What, what I, is- I, I think I got that from my mother and father because they saw the life as very exciting they found everything exciting and joyful. And um, I'm writing right now about, a, I, I seem to write fathers that are very sweet. I think since I lost my husband and he was such a good father, I write about kind fathers. So I said to, I called my son, John, who's here the other day. And I said, I had a really romantic, erotic dream. You can, you can uh, edit that out too if you want about this man this father and and john said well i suppose at your age in your dreams is where you get it <laughs> so 
that was a great line. But anyway, and I said it to Emily and I said, uh, did, have you ever heard this happen? She said, it happened to you before when you wrote the, the Prairie um, book, Just Dance. You right. liked other very much. So I guess I tell them all my secrets. It, the, through your, not your children, through, it, no. through your books. Through my care, through my books. Isn't that, is, it, is writing uh, painful for you or is it fun? What, no, what? it's fun and I like it and I go to it. And um, the place that I, when I get stuck, I go to bed and it always comes to me in bed. What is it about bed? You get there back with the pillows and then I have to get up and come over and write all the notes because I solve big problems. Uh, yeah, I get, the, I, for me, the shower is that way. The shower. Some people, yes, they do that. You heard other people say that? Yes. So, you know, I'm from California and we think it's the negative ions in the running water. We're, we're well, I think you should get into your pool. <laughs> That's right. But it's Wealthy so Californian. <laughs> what, what do you look like when you're writing? Are you, do you have a writing place? Do you have a writing time? Of oh, day? I looked at that and I thought, what do I look like? I'm frazzled and I didn't know what you meant by it. I'm in my writing room now and it's up at the top of my house. All the shades are closed because the light comes in. I can't see my, you know, uh -huh. but the birds are right outside and I'm up on this hill and I have a very big house with a lot of clutter and, um, it's a very nice house. And I have a house at the Cape um, where I, ha in Truro, where Mary Oliver lived. And I can oh. tell you about a thing I'm writing for her later when we talk about the genres. Uh, let's talk about Mary. Do we have to wait? Can we get- No, no. Um, she used to walk her dogs in town and I would see her when I was walking my dogs or I would see her at the market and we would smile at each other, but I have great admiration for her. Sure. And um, so I, I wrote a picture book, which is coming out. I don't know when it's coming to be illustrated now. And it's called My Poet, about the child who lives next door to a poet and follows the poet um, all the time with the notebook, trying to figure out where her words come from. Do they come from, does it, do they come from the fur of her dogs? Do they come from the Rosa Ragosa that's by the shore? Do they come by the spider web? And so it's really a dedication to her. And she wrote this wonderful poem about her dog that I always think dogs make us better people. And the dog in the night, and I forget the whole poem, but just these two lines made me love her even more. The dog looks over at her the night with fervent eyes and says, tell me you love me, tell me again. And she says, isn't this wonderful? He asks and I get to tell. Oh. And that's just, that makes me get goosebumps right now, just even saying the words that aren't quite proper, but there's something about her. And so I'm always moved. So one of the things that Mary Oliver talked about was paying attention. That was that was her, oh. her, her yeah. thing. And it seems like that's what you're talking about too, not only paying attention to the landscape, but to what's going on in your life that yeah. is, Mm -hmm. yes. he does she was very attached she respected children very much she had a great reverence for them I don't think she had any and she loved was a great dog lover and she was kind of liked all she liked the landscape so that we liked all the the same things and I think she was very elemental and very bare boned in her writing boy she got right to what she was writing about you didn't have to clutter through her work to find out what she said right right my yeah that's very interesting she's absolutely my favorite poet um, yep absolutely all times um so you had mentioned genre we were going to talk about that because you you have an incredible aptitude to write across genres you're you're happy in the novel format you're happy you're happy in in different picture books different kinds of picture books different kinds of novels do you do you think your your voice as an author is consistent across genres? Do you do you change it or think about it or try and change it? What what do you think is the trick to be able to? I don't know. I think I get a little more slapstick with some of the picture books, uh -huh. like um some of the funny ones that I've right. written, uh -huh. you know, that are kind of true stories about dogs that I know. But I think for the most part, I think, you know, writing about Mary Oliver is just as intense as writing a novel, really. 
-hmm. and how you bare bone it. And I delete, and my delete button is right here next to me. <laughs> Very close. I'm going to put a little heart on it so I can see, make sure I see it. <laughs> That amazing, you know, the, the word delete is, is um, it's a wonderful word. I wonder what it is in French or German. Oh, well, I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to, when we post this, I'm going to put it up in the chat so everyone will know about it because I can, I can research it. So what, what are the, the, let's talk personally for a minute. What are the joys and pleasures of living your life as a children's book writer? Are you, are you, uh, uh, do you think you have a writerly life? Is that how you would have defined your yeah, day? Yeah, I like my life. Well, my father was kind of a writer, and I'm in a writer's group with people like Jane Yolen and, and Leslie Newman, who thinks you're one of the greatest interviewers, oh, okay. and uh, people like that. And so we don't meet. They're meeting at Zoom, and I refuse to meet by Zoom because I can't see well, and it just makes it uh, confusing. But pretty soon, with all our vaccines, uh -huh. we will get to meet on our porches again. So, um, but that's nice. It's nice to hear your work read out loud to you. And when you can't do that, you don't get a sense of feel. That's why I send it to my children. So um, in your writer's group, this incredibly uh, uh, legendary writer's group, I've been jealous. Yeah, of they are. Yeah. yeah. So do you read each other's work out loud? Uh, yes, and we do. And I don't read mine anymore because I can't read print on paper. That's the worst thing. Um, but they read it. And when you hear it, you hear it's so much better to hear it spoken because uh -huh. you can think of somebody reading to a child or or a, or a mother or right. a grandmother, you know, that's true. And and the, the the other pleasures about writing for children, obviously, you you believe in your work and you get a sense of satisfaction that you're communicating uh -huh. with kids. Would well, you love the, do you love the it sounds like you love the process and you love. The days. I do like it. I don't complain a whole lot, do I, John? I'm talking to John now. Um, no, and I, I'm feeling really, really good because the minute that I'm through with all this, I don't mean that, that that's going to make me feel good. But I will get back to my work, and I think, I, I think you've given me some courage to finish my book because good, you have confidence in me. There is such a thing as a dedication page. Let me just remind you. And oh, 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 that's right. <laughs> and I can spell your name. <laughs> that's right. I made it very easy for anyone. You know, to... you know what's interesting, though? I was thinking about what you said at the very end. Um, I forget what your last question was, but it was one, one of my... I was talking... You talked about why children. And uh, Natalie Babbitt was a good friend of mine. And we were at a conference together. And someone asked us what is the most important part of your writing life? When was it? Whatever. We were all thinking, and Natalie said, preschool. The thing I worried about in preschool, I worry about as an adult. And I thought, oh my God, she's right. And so the whole thing comes back. We need to know our background. We need to know what children are and we need to know the landscape. And it's funny because the book I was telling you about that I'm writing um, is about a poet, a father, who's a very nice poet, father, who I had the romantic dream about. And he and his daughter go to their cabin in the woods and he's writing and she's writing poetry. And um, it's like, he writes a poem about his wife and uses the word passion and she said, you're shy that I know what the word passion means, aren't you? But I know it. It's like right back at my childhood when I was five years old. Yeah, and the child in my book um, saves notebooks and writes titles because she's so, in, she likes it. And she forgets it at home and she's horrified because she really likes titles. She said, sometimes they invite you, sometimes they fool you. And her father says, then there's always the second the first line of a, of a poem. I learned a lot from writing this myself. And he said, the title taps you on the shoulder and the first line takes you by the hand. Oh, this is so wonderful. And so I have come right back to sitting behind that big chair in my parents' living room, you know, trying to put parentheses around words that don't work. 
but it's right from my childhood when I was five. Well, the, the trick is, is, as we pointed out in this, is to see the meaning in your own life. And then what you write isn't isn't day-to-day -day stuff, but you're investing it with with meaning and with poetry. I guess so, or with light. Yes, or and that, that, that is, uh, that's, to me, it's, it's the real gift of true writers is not so much the wordsmithing and the, and the crafting and the suspense and all that, but the ability to find that path into yourself. I that's, think that's true. I think I have to become a part of my books. I have to walk into them. Yes. and be able to walk out of them again and, and pass them on. I think that's true. Well, it, that's brilliant, Patty. I mean, I hope everybody in the audience is listening to that because it, it sounds easy, but it's actually the work of a lifetime, isn't it? You know, to-, to It is, it is. Self-reflection and self-knowledge. And it's nice. I can get up at three in the morning and have three coffees with three tablespoons of sugars in each one, yes. which my doctor said is not a good idea. And then that's my good writing time before life in the television comes on with all the bad news and everything. All right, so let's talk about that for one second. So you, yeah. I've, I've heard you say that you write what's on your mind and also what you worry about. So with all, with given that here we are in 2021, what are you worried about and what kinds of stories might emerge from that? Well, you know, I don't write about bad events. I worry about the pandemic. I worry about children being isolated. I worry about children with no food. And I don't write about all of them, but there's that certain thing that I want to write a story that touches what's really happening. Um, not necessarily all the politics of it, but the feelings of it and how children feel because I know my grandchildren are not enjoying being home from school away from their friends and everything. That's, I think what I worry about. What what what's on your computer right now? What what can we look forward to? Well, the end of my book. If I could only find a title for it. Oh, that's it. It might be called "Dear Father, Dear Daughter" because they write each other poems. Who knows? All right. Well, waiting to hear from that. So we're kind of at the end of our time with, and I told you yes. this was bye bye. But I would love for you. I'm going to really put you on the spot to give to to leave our your 5,000 new best friends who are watching this um, with uh, some kind of inspiration about how, how and why we should continue to write for children. What, what should be our motivation, our thought, the thing that keeps us going when we feel, uh, when we feel down or discouraged? Well, children matter. Children um, have their inner joys and their inner sorrows. Mm -hmm. And they see everything, they know everything. They don't always understand it, but it's surprising. All of my grandchildren really understand a lot of what goes on in life. And I just think it's nice to be able to reach out and touch them, even if to ask them a question in a story or to put a character there that's going through the same kinds of problems. I just think we owe them. I really do think we owe the children in our in our lifetime. And we owe them what kinds of quality attention, certainly, but what else are we are you offering? Well, the truth and strengths and ways to deal with things, you know, alternatives and to know their landscape too. To encourage them to know their own landscape. I think so. I think it makes a difference. Well, let me tell you something. You have made a huge difference in the world of children's books. This, the body of work that you are engaged still in creating is remarkable and inspirational. And oh, thank you. Uh, when I think of Natalie Babbitt and I think of you, yeah. you know, my two favorite books in the world are Tuck Everlasting and yeah. Paul. So I didn't know that you were friends, but I'm, I'm yeah. glad to hear that. And I'm so, I'm so glad to get to talk to you. I think um, I spoke to someone who said, oh, you're talking to Patty McLaughlin. That's going to be, she's so poetic. It's going to be, aren't you intimidated? And I said, um, well, I think I know the real Patty McLaughlin. And I That's think- exactly. I'm not poetic at all in person. I'm a slouch. I, I use bad language sometimes. And my children 
You're still here, aren't you, John? He knows all my secrets. Well, it's a great thing. It's I swear a like a sailor, he just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I thank you for giving all 5,000 people an opportunity to get to know you and to not be uh, intimidated by your work. And what you what you had to say about the about the pathway and about knowing yourself and about being spared entering into into the work yourself is really profound. It, it deserves a lot of thought. Well, so, I think people need courage and that's that's hard to find sometimes. Courage to finish that sentence. Writers need courage to courage to get into a book, mm -hmm. courage to write a book, courage to put the first sentence down and the second and try to make sense. Yeah. And to tell the truth, which is what yeah. you, you always you always by the end get to get to a truth that matters. And uh, wow. that's that's, Thank you. that's a remarkable uh, quality and. I love you very much. I think you're great. I love your work and I love you. And I love that you swear like a sailor. I think that's <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. It's been great talking to you. All right, you too, Patty. We're going to sign off now. Okay. Um, and thank you. You are the you are the closing speaker at this amazing conference. And I can't think of anyone of any better way to to leave people after these several days. You must be exhausted. I, <laughs> I am. Anyway, exhausted and thrilled. Thrilled to talk to you. So okay, thank you, thank you for the good question. All right, you're great. Thank you. Thank you.